guys, you are welcome to part five, the final part of the series, Coronavirus, the real issues behind the scenes. The title of this last presentation is Coronavirus and the Remnant People of God. Let us bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for how far you have brought us in this series. Through this series, you have helped us to understand the real issues behind the coronavirus disease. Father, as we go through this final presentation, please open our hearts to understand the subject of your end time remnant movement. This and many more blessings we ask in the worthy name of Jesus. Amen. May you be abundantly blessed as you listen to this presentation. Friends, I want to thank the Lord so much for how far he has brought us. This presentation will be the last in our five-part series on coronavirus, the real issues behind the scenes. The title of this last presentation is Coronavirus and the Remnant People of God. Friends, Revelation chapter 12 presents a woman standing on the moon, clothed with the sun, and with a crown of 12 stars on her head. This woman represents the people of God throughout the ages. Friends, concerning this woman, who is a symbolic representation of God's people, we read the following. And the dragon was wrought with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Friends, the scripture uses the words remnant of her seed to describe God's end time movement. As we discover from this test, Satan is angry with the remnant church of God because they keep all the commandments of God, including the seventh day Sabbath. From Revelation chapter 14 verse 12, we read similar words concerning God's end time people. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Always in the description of God's end time people, we are told that they keep the commandments of God, all the ten commandments, including the seventh day Sabbath. Friends, God's end time people also have the testimony of Jesus. You may be wondering, what is the testimony of Jesus? If we go to Revelation chapter 19 verse 10, we read the following, And I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Friends, God's end time people have got two main characteristics. Number one, they lovingly obey all of his commandments, including the seventh day Sabbath. And number two, they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Beloved, the spirit of the prophets, as was manifested in prophets like John, Daniel, Isaiah, and Jeremiah, was also manifested in Ellen Gold White, one of the key founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Beloved, 
the seventh day adventist church is the remnant church of god it is god's end time movement in these last days this is the only worldwide denomination that keeps all the ten commandments of god including the sabbath and also has the spirit of the prophets as exemplified in the life and work of ellen gold white friends this woman was a remarkable woman she wrote a book way back in the 1800s with the title the great controversy this book will help you to make sense of what is happening in our world today beloved these are not the only characteristics that sets forth the seventh day adventist church as the remnant church of god there are several others that you can find in the scripture friends once again the title of this presentation is coronavirus and the remnant people of god before we delve into what is happening in our world now in relation to the remnant church of god i want us to listen to a testimony from one of the remarkable politicians america has ever had now listening to hillary clinton's testimony concerning the seventh day adventist church it's an honor to address the members of the seventh day adventist church I am flattered and humbled to have this chance to speak to such a vibrant and active group of people. One of the things I admire most about Seventh-day Adventists, in addition to your faith, is your commitment to preach, teach, and heal. Your emphasis on educating and nurturing your fellow man and woman is a model for all people of faith to follow. And your network of schools and health care facilities put into action the tenets of those beliefs. For that is the calling to all of us, not just to believe, but to act. To be true to our beliefs and to fully express our faith, we need freedom. Our religious freedom is a cornerstone of this great nation. And I personally appreciate the work of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in promoting religious freedom, not just here, but around the world. I am particularly proud to join you in supporting the Workplace Religious Freedom Act. When I think of what a good and decent society should look like, I imagine one in which the government does not hinder faith, but rather recognizes what people of faith do to make our communities stronger and to make our families stronger as well. Families, after all, are the building block of any society. I know the Seventh-day Adventist Church has a strong commitment to family, a commitment that is represented in how you observe the Sabbath together. With faith and strong families and the freedom to allow faith to prosper, our people and our nation will be ready to embrace the future. Thank you again for inviting me to address you. May God bless you and your families. May God bless the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and may God bless our dear and beloved country, the United States of America. Friends, I am moved by this testimony, and I hope you are moved as well. Now, let's get back to current world issues. Friends, in our previous presentation, we talked about Pope Francis encyclical on the environment. We learned that one of the key measures that Pope Francis has placed in this encyclical to combat climate change is Sunday rest. Beloved, if there is a group that has contributed to saving our environment through resting one day a week that friends is the seventh day adventist church this church has not been coerced by an earthly power to rest on a particular day but they have lovingly 
obeyed the voice of God to keep the seventh day Sabbath holy. And so every seventh day, seventh day Adventists across the globe suspend all businesses and come to rest and worship at the feet of their creator. Friends, it is important for us to understand the point that resting one day out of seven even though may have some advantages is just not the solution to save our planet from ruin friends the bible helps us to understand that this planet is on a collision course to destruction and will only be restored after the second coming of jesus Beloved, in as much as Seventh-day Adventists believe that we must do our part to ensure that we have a better home, a better environment, a better climate here on earth, our focus is not on this earth. The second coming of Christ is the heartbeat of God's end-time remnant people. Friends, it will interest you to know that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has been meeting every five years for a general conference session. This year, plans were far advanced for a general conference session. And guess what? The theme of the session was Jesus is coming. Get involved. As I stated earlier, the heartbeat of God's end time people is the second coming of Christ. Listening to this song by the participants of the last general conference session that was held in San Antonio, Texas. I believe it will inspire your heart to want something better instead of this deteriorating sin sick well. Oh, I agree with the elder. We're going to lift up the trumpet. We're going to loud let it ring because who's coming soon? Jesus. We're going to stand. We're going to sing verse one, two, three. And then the organ will give us a little interlude. Stand up, stand up, come on. And then we'll go into that fourth verse. All the verses. Let's sing with attitude. Let's sing with joy. Let's sing with excitement. Lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. Cheer up, he will be in your 
Raise my heart, hands for heaven. Lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. Jesus is coming. From Revelation chapter 21, verse 1 to 4, we read about the creation of a brand new world after the second coming of Christ. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. I thought you were going to say an amen to that. Friends, this is encouraging. It gives us hope beyond what we are seeing in our world now. For amidst typhoons and hurricanes, amidst fires, amidst the global warming, amidst devastating weather, amidst the terrible climate, the Apostle John tells us that I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Friends, this is where I want to place my hope, not on the contents of any encyclical, but on the sheer word of the Holy Scriptures. Friends, the coronavirus disease has had two major negative effects on the remnant church of God. First, it has made us to postpone a very important general conference session. A session where the world church was going to plan on how we are to take the gospel to the unreached portions of the world so Jesus can come. Second, the coronavirus pandemic is now enabling governments to pass laws seemingly to protect their people, but actually placing a hindrance on the part of God's people in spreading the everlasting gospel. Friends, in my own country, Ghana, the president, through the parliament, has passed a law that is called Imposition of Restrictions Bill. Here is what we read from the news in relation to this bill. From myjoyonline.com, we read the following. Parliament passes imposition of restrictions bill. Here are some of the key details under this headline. Parliament has passed the imposition of restrictions bill on Friday despite opposition by the minority. What does the bill entail? The bill essentially allows the president to impose restrictions reasonably required in the interest of defense, public safety, public health, or the running of essential services. It also allows the president to impose restrictions on movement or residence within Ghana of any persons. The president could also restrict the freedom of entry into Ghana. And now this portion is where I want you to catch. The bill additionally says the president will impose restrictions for the purpose of safeguarding the people of Ghana against teaching or propagation of a doctrine which exhibits or encourages disrespect for the nationhood of Ghana, the national symbols and emblems, or incites hatred against other community members. Anyone who flouts the restriction commits an offense and is liable on summary conviction to a fine of not less than 1,000 penalty units and not more than 5,000 penalty units. 
we read that each unit is 12 Ghana cities, putting the range of fine at between 12,000 Ghana cities and 60,000 Ghana cities. The convict could also be liable to a prison term of not less than three months and not more than six months, or both a fine and imprisonment. The penalties were introduced into the bill by Parliament's Constitution and Legal Affairs Committee after the minority complained the original document from the executive gave the president too much power, including determining penalties. In some portion of this article, we read that President Nana Ekufu Addo on Sunday night announced plans to introduce the bill to help deal with the coronavirus spread in the country. Former Deputy Attorney General Dr. Dominic Aine, who is also Deputy Minority Spokesperson on Legal Affairs, insists the new bill does not deal with the coronavirus spread. And that's what he says. The government used the coronavirus as an opportunistic window to bring this bill to parliament. All the justification was about coronavirus, but there was no mention of coronavirus in the bill, he told Joy News after the bill passed. Friends, before this bill got to parliament to be passed, an association in Ghana called Advocates for Christ Ghana sensed danger and put together this article for the government to consider. We read Advocates for Christ Ghana and then there is a heading, Citizens Alert, Dangers with the Imposition of Restrictions Bill 2020, Expunge Section 3 from the proposed bill or focus on Act 851, etc. Citizens Alert, Dangers with the Imposition of Restrictions Bill 2020. And then here is the message. We are Ghanaian citizens and professionals with diverse backgrounds and from different denominations. We commend the president and his cabinet for their bold stance taken to protect public health in these unprecedented times. We are praying to God to give our president and leaders the wisdom to continue to guide our country. And then they continue. We have noted with concern a particular clause in the Imposition of Restrictions Bill 2020, currently under consideration by the Parliament of the Republic, specifically Clause 3, 1D of the bill that reads, the restriction is reasonably required for safeguarding the people of Ghana against the teaching or propagation of a doctrine which exhibits or encourages disrespect for the nationhood of Ghana, the national symbols and emblems, or incites hatred against other members of the community. We respectfully submit the following. 1. This clause in no way addresses the current COVID-19 predicament we face as a country, and we are extremely surprised and worried as to how and why this clause found its way into a bill whose aim is to help fight the spread of the coronavirus. Number 2. The wording of sections 2 and 3, 1D of the proposed bill, specifically the section which reads, or incites hatred against other members of the community can bring an unacceptable choice for Christians and Muslims and persons of faith when we have to speak up against homosexuality, etc., and is therefore going to be flouted. In addition, it is a self-serving tool in the hands of any power-hungry politician. Number three. They say the powers inherent in our Public Health Act 2012, that's Act 851 alone, are enough to sanction any persons who seek to flout the directives given by the president without the introduction of a new law. Number four, we therefore oppose any law seeking to place restrictions on citizens' rights to free speech and the practice of religion. Number five, it is not the position of the government and or any human institution to dictate how a group or person should exercise faith or conscience towards a country 
its symbols and all fellow citizens. Number six, instead of hastily passing a bill which at the moment lacks clarity of focus, government should convene a team of experts to update not most enabling legislation and provide accompanying regulations to Act 851 as a matter of agency. And now they conclude, the Ghanaian faith community has supported all government's efforts to fight the coronavirus and has suspended services and gatherings to help curb any community spread. We have also intensified education in our various churches, etc., and implemented the necessary preventive measures to help reduce the spread of the virus. However, given the choice to serve either God or country, we will have no choice in that matter but to serve God. We therefore kindly ask the government of the Republic of Ghana to refrain from passing a law that puts us and other persons of faith in this country in a position where they would have to choose between faith and country. God bless our homeland, Ghana. Seventh day Adventists across the globe. Are you seeing what is coming? Our constitutional privilege of preaching the three angels' messages are being thrown out the window right before our very eyes through the vehicle of the coronavirus pandemic. Brethren, the pen of inspiration has this to say in relation to how we must relate to governments. The people of God will recognize human government as an ordinance of divine appointment and will by precept and example teach obedience to it as a sacred duty so long as its authority is exercised within its legitimate sphere. But when its claims conflict with the claims of God, we must choose to obey God rather than men. The word of God must be recognized and obeyed as an authority above that of all human legislation. Thus saith the Lord is not to be set aside, for it thus saith the church or the state. The crown of Christ is to be uplifted above all the diadems of earthly potentates. This is from the Home Missionary, November 1, 1893. Friends, from the pen of inspiration, we read about the marching orders of God's end time movement. In a special sense, Seventh day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. This is from Testimonies, Volume 9. Page 19, paragraph 1. Seventh-day Adventists across the world must act now. This is the time to wake up, for we may just have up to the signing of the Global Educational Pact in October of 2020 to do a work that will not be hindered by secular law. You might say, oh, that date is so close. God is likely to give his church more time. Friends, if you have followed the series from the presentation one up until now, I believe you can see through how the order of events are unfolding before our very eyes. The prophet of God, Ellen G. White, writes, the agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating they are strengthening for the last great crisis. Great changes are soon to take place in our world. And then she asks, and the final movements will be rapid ones. Beloved, the final movements will be rapid ones. This is the time to wake up and act. 
How? From Testimonies, Volume 9, page 20, Paragraph 1, we read this. Are we to wait until the fulfillment of the prophecies of the end before we say anything concerning them? Of what value will our words be then? Shall we wait until God's judgments fall upon the transgressor before we tell him how to avoid them? Where is our faith in the word of God? Must we see things foretold come to pass before we will believe what he has said? In clear, distinct rays, light has come to us, showing us that the great day of the Lord is near at hand, even at the doors. Let us read and understand before it is too late. This is from Testimonies, Volume 9, page 20, paragraph 1. Friends, this is a time to go out and warn the world. If we don't do that now, we will be compelled by the Spirit to do it in a time of crisis. This is exactly what the Spirit of Prophecy tells us. Testimonies, Volume 5, page 4, three, Paragraph 2. We are told, the work which the church has failed to do in a time of peace and prosperity, she will have to do in a terrible crisis under most discouraging, forbidding circumstances. Friends, as I bring this presentation to a close, I want to make three solemn appeals. My first appeal goes to Seventh-day Adventists across the world. Friends, this is the time to go out there and preach the third angel's message. Do you have family and friends who are yet to hear this message? This is the time to tell them. This is the time to tell the world the truth in relation to the mark of the beast and how they can avoid it in the soon coming future. My second appeal goes to faithful Protestants and people in the various religions of the world. Friends, this is the time for you to wake up. Can't you see how through the ecumenical movement your leaders have sold you up to Catholicism? Hear what the Antichrist power has to say in relation to God's end time people. Perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change the church ever did happened in the first century. The holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday, not from any directions noted in the scriptures, but from the church's sense of its own power. People who think that the scriptures should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy. This is from St. Catherine Catholic Church Sentinel, May 21, 1995. Beloved, I believe this quote from Catholicism will enable you to make a very important stand for the truth. It does not matter whether you are a Protestant or someone in another religion of the world. God wants you to come out of the apostate ecumenical system of Babylon before it is too late. From Revelation 18.4, we read the following solemn warning to all of God's children who continue to associate with Babylon. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Now, my final appeal goes to all worldly loving people. Friends, this is the time to come back to your heavenly father. As I have stated earlier, this world is on a collision course to destruction. You can't put your trust in it. Jesus is coming again. 
and this event is the only hope for all mankind. Beloved, it does not matter what you have done in the past if you will only accept the atoning sacrifice of Jesus on your behalf. If you will make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life today, he will forgive you of all the sins that you have committed and make you a beautiful son or daughter of God. You can then be looking forward into the future with the hope of entering a brand new world at the second coming of Jesus. If this is your wish, if this is your prayer, why don't you bow your head so we pray together? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for how far you have brought us. Through this presentation, you have helped us to understand the subject of your end time remnant movement. You have helped us to understand that Jesus and his second coming is the only hope for this world. Please, Father, give us the grace to be able to make a firm decision for you in relation to the truth that you have brought onto our paths today. In the worthy and precious name of Jesus, we have prayed. Amen. We have this hope that bends within us. time is here when the nations far and near shall awake and shout and sing Alleluia Christ is King we have this hope that bends within us Jesus Christ our Lord, we are united in His love, love for the waiting people of the world, people who need a Savior's love. Soon the heads will open wide, Christ will come to claim his bride, all the universe will sing.